Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in our complimentary webinar series for U.S. federal government contractors. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. You probably found out about today's webinar through our newsletter, which reaches over 23,000 federal government contractors and service providers. Today's session is complimentary and also recorded. You can find the recording on our website and YouTube channel about 24 hours after the webinar though usually even sooner. We have over 540 complimentary webinars on our YouTube channel. This includes all 52 parts of the FAR, all 52 parts of the DFARS, and hundreds of webinars on strategic and tactical topics. If you'd like to advertise in our newsletter or in any of our upcoming webinars, please email us at hello at jennifershaus.com. And a little bit more about us, we are a specialized consulting firm focused on working with established federal contractors. We work with product, service, and software firms across the globe. For more information about our services, please visit our website and select About Us. As mentioned, today's webinar covering the FAR supplements is complimentary and recorded. We began this series in January 2022, and you can find the past recordings on our website, as well as the future schedule with registration links. And here's just a look at what we've covered so far. Um, we've actually gone through the majority of the FAR supplements, but we'll be winding down the series on August 24th with the Veterans Administration. And then on Fridays, we cover the same agency or department in a playbook series. The Friday webinars discuss upcoming bidding opportunities, contracting trends, small business resources, and oftentimes feature a government speaker. The full schedule and past recordings for playbooks are on our website, um, again, under the playbook tab. Please note that this fall, we will be starting a new webinar series covering subcontracting opportunities in the different government departments. These webinars will be on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern and begin September 7th with the Department of Agriculture. You can find registration links and the full schedule on our website under the subcontracting tab. We also have sponsorship opportunities available. And now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors who help make this webinar series possible. First, we'd like to thank the Virginia PTAC, the Virginia PTAC is based out of GMU in Fairfax and offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTACs can offer. And a special thanks to the Federal Business Council. The FBC creates and manages virtual and in-person meetings and events to connect industry and government thought leaders, product providers, and solutions with government programs that use them. The FBC works with a variety of federal agencies to connect government and industry in the form of in-person and virtual conferences, training events, policy dialogue, and outreach. Over the last 40 plus years, FBC has become a comprehensive resource for connecting industry and the federal government. Next, we'd like to thank Dastin. Dastin is an IT and cloud solution provider working with corporations, the military, and government agencies to lower their costs, increase scalability, improve operational efficiency, and meet compliance regulations using targeted cloud-based solutions. Dastin is a certified partner of Oracle NetSuite, a premier tier Google Cloud partner, and certified partner of Cisco, Virtue, AO Docs, and Authenticate. For more information about Dastin services or to schedule a complimentary consultation, please email Joe Alston or visit the Dastin website. Next, we'd like to thank C3. C3 ISIT develops tailor-made technology solutions that increase efficiency, bolster productivity, and improve business processes. C3 is the leading provider of managed IT services as well as compliant cybersecurity solutions for federal contractors. C3 works with defense contractors to achieve and maintain CMMC 2.0, DFARS, and NIST 800-171. Contact C3 to learn about the CMMC 2.0 readiness program. The contact information is on your screen. 
Next, we'd like to thank RLJ Financial. Founded in 2008, RLJ Financial Consultants is a customer-focused, quality-driven, minority and locally owned provider of commercial insurance brokerage services. Their services are designed to maximize your return on investment in managing the risk to your business. Call Roderick today at 202-832-1417 for a free consultation and insurance quote. And lastly, we'd like to thank the PubK Group. The PubK Group publishes news and insights for government contractors, agencies, and council. Every day, PubK delivers news on bid protests, contract disputes, new laws and regulations, cybersecurity requirements, false claims act activity, and developments in mergers and acquisitions in the GovCon community. In daily news briefs and in-depth conversations in podcasts and webinars, PubK leverages its deep bench of government contract experts to keep you up to date on fast-changing government rules and expectations. And every January, PubK presents its week-long annual review featuring more than 50 GovCon experts across a dozen panels, recapping the year's top developments. Participation in CLEs are free to subscribers. Visit PubK online at www.pubkgroup.com. And thank you again to the attendees and to our speaker for joining us today in the FAR Supplement Series. Today, we are here to dig into the FAR Supplement on the Department of Justice. So let's meet our speaker for today. Our speaker today is Jim Fontana, and he represents the firm Fontana Law Group. Um, as a reminder, we don't take any questions, so if you have any questions for Jim, his contact information is here on the screen and will also be displayed at the end of the presentation, so you can contact him directly. Thank you, Jim, for joining us today. I'm going to put myself on mute. Um, just let me know when you're ready for the next slide. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, again, Jim Fontana. I'm a government contracts lawyer. I've been doing this for about uh, 38 years. Uh, so I've been around this block. Uh, we're going to talk today focusing on um, the Department of Justice, Justice Acquisition Regulation, everybody calls it the JAR. Um, and uh, some of the stuff, we're going to go through the JAR and the key issues. I don't want to get too legalistic um, with you. I mean, it, I, I found that uh, what, what people like to know about are things that affect their business or affect their organization, not so much legal citations. I do make citations to the JAR and the FAR and that kind of thing, and I have a lot of hyperlinks here. I hope this, um, I forgot to ask, but I, I think this presentation would be available to everybody so you can click on the hyperlinks without putting too much detail in the slides. But we'll talk about the JAR today. Let's go to the next slide, please. Mm, I, could, I go back. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, contracting the U.S. Department of Justice um, agencies, uh, they have a lot of commonalities. There are some differences. Justice has its own um, unique aspects uh, and some of its quirks. I haven't, uh, like I said, I've been doing this for 38 years. I have not handled contracts with every single office or division within DOJ, but many of them. I put in uh, just the facts, man, if anybody remembers a TV show called uh, Dragnet, that was sort of a common refrain by one of the detectives and basically it's law enforcement. And you still get people in, in federal agencies that say that. So we're going to present the facts, a little bit of the legal stuff, but hopefully the practical application of what this means to your business or organization. Okay, next slide. Okay. Little history of DOJ. Everybody pretty much knows what the department, U.S. Department of Justice is. Um, it, it, it is one of the original cabinet positions. The Attorney General uh, Office was established in 1789. The DOJ, the actual organization, wasn't created until uh, 1870, sometime later. Uh, first AG, or Attorney General, uh, Edmund Jennings Randolph, of course, everybody remembers him. And the current is the 86th Attorney General. Garland. Uh, the Attorney General is, is considered, and I'm sure many people have heard this, the nation's chief law enforcement officer. Um, basically, it's, it's the largest law office in the world. 
in terms of the number of lawyers or the number of, uh, in this case, you know, special agents and staff and that kind of thing. Um, it's the biggest, about 115,000 employees um, total uh, across 50 countries. Um, most of those are all lawyers, special agents, staff. Um, it touts its mission to uphold the rule of law, to keep our country safe and to protect civil rights, which is very flowery. In other words, it's in charge of enforcing federal laws. Um, there are over 62 offices, boards, and divisions, what they call OBDs. I'll go to the next slide. Let's see the org chart, which uh, I put here, and it, it, it shows you the, the different uh, offices. This, by the way, includes 93 federal judicial districts um, throughout the U.S., which, which means if you heard of a, a U.S. attorney's office, and each district has an appointed, appointed by the president, U.S. attorney and a number of assistant U.S. attorneys in each district. And they're responsible for litigating mostly criminal cases in that appointed district. There's a district of D.C., for example, and if you've been reading the news, you've heard of the acronym SDNY, which is the Southern District of New York. Uh, but they're all over the country. Uh, a good amount of work that justice does is a what they call the main justice building over at 9500 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest. Um, and within the main justice, that's where the attorney general resides, his deputy, one deputy, a lot of assistants. But you have a number of different uh, divisions within DOJ and, and main justice. You'll have the civil, civil division, uh, which is basically non-criminal cases. Government contracts litigation is usually under the civil division. And it's uh, litigated before the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. So there's the Civil Division, the Criminal Division, the Antitrust Division, the Civil Rights Division, Tax, uh, and lastly, Environment and Natural Resources Division. Um, and of course, the number of, of law enforcement agencies, typical, uh, very well known, FBA, FBI, DEA, ATF, which by the way is now called um, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives. They haven't changed the acronym, it's still ATF. The U.S. Marshal Service, USMS, uh, and the Bureau of Prisons. Um, a large agency, the, the DOJ, it, it's not the largest agency. Uh, the largest agency is, is the Department of De Defense, of course, and uh, some people may or may not know this, DOJ is not even the second largest agency, it might be the third. But the second largest agency is the Department of Veteran Affairs in any event. All right. And you see the org chart here. Again, this is all, all available. Next slide, please. Um, if you go back uh, to 2000, and there, there's all these different, you know, how much a year the, the, the DOJ spends on contract, basically outsourcing its goods and services. Um, and the measure I'll use here is since 2000, DOJ spent about $35 billion on contracts to private concerns. Uh, the biggest spenders, as you can imagine, well, the biggest spender is, is the, the Bureau of Prisons or the federal prison system uh, for which I, I used to work many, many years ago. And then the FBI, Marshal Service, and DEA. That's that's where a good amount of the dollars spent. Um, the management and oversight of DOJ's uh, acquisition uh, function is is under the JMD, the Justice Management Division. You can see the hyperlink there. Um, and that it's it's a division that also covers a number of things. Basically, the the administrative side of DOJ so it covers budgeting. Management, telecom, security, and a bunch of other administrative matters. Um, but the actual procurement function then is run by the procurement services staff, the PSS, and that's where the head of the contracting agency or contracting activity, sorry, the HCA as we call it, presides. And keep that in mind because we'll talk about that. Um, the, the PSS is basically the contracting, it's responsible for the acquisition of the activities of all the 
again, offices of boards, divisions, or OBDs. Um, and again, you can you can look at that website. It is important as it does list the major procurement offices around the country and a list of the contract officers. Um, the Assistant Attorney General for Administration is the HCA. The HCA will make a, a lot of decisions that only the HCA can make. It's basically, could be uh, more in this case, the OJ, it's, it's a number of different steps above the actual warranty contracting offices. And of course, you have contracting offices that are, that are, are there, they reside within PSS. Um, they're located in DC and other jurisdictions. Um, and of course, you have the OBD procurement offices, which are mostly in DC. Now, having said that, when you look at the OBDs, it's a, it's a very decentralized agency, like many agencies, um, federal agencies, is that each of the offices, boards, divisions, uh, for the most part, do their own procurement. They have to follow the law, they have to follow the rules, they have to follow the DOJ uh, internal guidance um, in doing so. It, I mean, is it uniform throughout the OBDs? No, it is just like it's not uniform within the Army or the different offices, for example. Um, there could be a lot of inconsistencies, but by and large, it has to be, it has to follow the law, it has to follow the regulations. Okay. Next slide, please. So not much discussion here. Uh, question is, what is what the OJ buys? Um, and it's you know pretty much everything. Federal agencies, like many governments, don't make their own equipment. They don't make their own products. And in many cases, uh, unless it's what they call inherently government, um, a lot of their services are out, especially over the last 20 years, as everybody knows, being its business. But you'll see it's you know everything from the IT equipment and managed services to firearms, um, storage, of course they have to buy automobiles. If you look to the right, that's that's where some of the, uh, the neat stuff is, where the, the cybercrime support, which is a, a, a very much growing uh, industry, the counterintelligence support, not everything in terms of terrorism, counterintelligence, uh, terrorism or counterintelligence is done in-house. Contractors have a big role. In that. And of course, legal and paralegal. They, they outsource legal services is not uncommon with DOJ, both in terms of lawyers, and especially paralegal or legal administration type folks. And of course, court reporting, which is outsourced as well. All right, next slide. <laughs> Um, I put this up as well, and I encourage you to go to the forecast of, of contracting opportunities. Um, that's that's also an important site, um, and, and it's fairly well updated, and it lists the new and upcoming uh, contracting opportunities within DOJ. Now, of course, you can go and look at SAM.gov, um, especially if you're following of course, you should, and what we call from a pre sales standpoint, looking at all the, uh, the pre RFP uh, communications and processes like the RFI processes or the source of sought process um, or uh, you know, draft solicitations. But a lot of the opportunities are telegraphed in this forecast of contracting opportunities. Um, and it's, it is a wealth of information if, you, if you're looking to do business within. DOJ. Um, not all the procurements are there. I would say most of them, but this is what what it includes. Um, so it's you know what, what what are the major buying activities? What are they buying? What method is going to be set aside? It could be eight A's, sole source. What the vehicle might be? It could be a GWAC, like NASA, SUV, or, or GSA, or any of the other uh, GWACs. You'll see in there TBD market research. Which means that there's really the, the, the pre-sales piece of it from a business standpoint. Is it still doing, the, the, or the, they haven't done the market research, or the market research is in process. They haven't yet determined what the procurement method, what the contract, like, or what vehicle they're going to use. And it also has the estimated values and target uh, dates, target RFP dates and target award dates. 
you take those with a grain of salt because you know the, the common refrain here in these businesses, you know, everything moves to the right. Um, and, and so those dates are going to vary. Um, place of performance and who's the incumbent, obviously, you know, important pieces to know. Uh, and this is the stuff that they end up point of contact, of course. But this is the, the basic information that you want to know uh, before the RFP is issued uh, and any information and intel that you can get going forward, um, again, you know, in, in advance of an award or advance of seeing an RFP. Okay, next slide, please. Um, most of the opportunities that you'll see, as I said, you'll see it on this website, but if the latest and the greatest typically will be on SAM.gov. If it's above the 25K threshold, sometimes GSA E5 if it's uh, off a schedule or GSA uh, vehicle. Um, and that's where you get, of course, also some of the RFIs, the draft RFPs and the amendments. Uh, so the most up to date would be SAM.gov. We just showed you forecast and contracting opportunities, and like I said, updated periodically. Would I be relying it? Would would I rely on it for something that may have just come out in the last couple of days? I wouldn't. I mean, that's that's where you get, um, you know, your contact with the agencies or your other research. I wouldn't rely exclusively on the forecast uh, page, but it, again, it is a great resource for someone. For those looking to do business with uh, DOJ, uh, I think I put this before the, the uh, uh, well, the forecast of contracting opportunities, but just to mention about uh, uh, small business representatives like any agencies, uh, DOJ has its what they call advocates, small business advocates. Um, like any agency, they have small business goals. Uh, the 2022 goal for primes is, is just north of 31 percent. Um, if you're small, that's important because you know which then opportunities are going to be set aside either for your size, for your NAICS size, or for your uh, socioeconomic status. So whether it's small, whether it's woman-owned small business, WSB or 8A, hub zone, ANC, um, they will telegraph it. They don't hold themselves to it until uh, pretty much the market uh, research is done and the RFP comes out. But at least, they, again, going back to the uh, forecast, uh, it'll telegraph what at least uh, at that current date that they posted it, uh, that it's planned to be. Um, and I think people know this, and this is where I get a little off the track, but you know, if you're a small business, of course, you want to look at small business uh, set aside opportunities. And if you're a large business, you want to do the same. You know, large businesses and small businesses can team together and and create a joint venture under what they call the SBA's mentor protege program, under which if you create a joint venture and you, you, if you follow the rules, do the right things, follow the regulations, then that joint venture as an entity can bid on set aside contracts, even though the mentor, the large business partner, uh, is uh, other than small. It's a great program. I do a lot of work in that uh, connection in terms of uh, formulating the JVs and representing the companies. Um, so the point being that you don't have to be a small business to look at small business opportunities. Next slide. Now, the, uh, in terms of the legal stuff, the, the, there are acquisition, acquisition regulations that um, derive from the statute, and that statute is primarily the competition and contract. Then you have your federal acquisition regulation, and then, of course, the JAR. You have here the JAR is published as part of the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, you, you can Google that or go into what they call ECSF and go on the 48 CFR. Uh, or you can go on what they call the FAR page um, and look at all the FAR provisions and the supplements, including the JAR. Um, sometimes uh, the ODDs will issue supplemental procurement guidance. That the ones that primarily that I've seen was uh, Marshall Service. They have a policy directive. The Bureau of Prisons has an acquisition policy. Um, the, the USMS policy directives, 
And one of the first couple of sentences says, this is to provide easy to read, I'm quoting, easy to read explanation uh, of the procurement process, but it's about 80 pages. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good explanation though. I didn't provide it here on the slides, so I didn't provide a hyperlink, but if you Google USMS Policy Directive 6.1, you'll pick it up. Um, I, I didn't do the same, my apologies with the BOP, uh, Bureau of Prisons Acquisition Policy, uh, what they call the BPAP, that's 155 pages. There's nothing there that I, I think it's it, it's a good resource to get very familiar with the, the process by which these two offices, and a hint on some of the other offices, and how they uh, conduct their, uh, their acquisitions and both from a practical and a policy standpoint. Um, with the BOP, by the way, just Google Bureau of Prisons Acquisition Policy, and you'll, you'll find that as well. Next slide. So one thing that, to know about the JAR um, and, and any of these other DOJ directives, they're, they're intended to, to implement and supplement. They're not supposed to supplant. They're not supposed to replace the FAR. They're not supposed to overrule the FAR. In other words, it's it's another layer uh, of uh, implementation guidance. It is binding on the contract, guidance on top of the FAR. Um, and it provides that additional guidance with regard to procurements within DOJ. And we, just about every agency has its own supplement. Um, but this is, again, for the DOJ. It's the same thing in other agencies. Uh, the FAR is supreme with the supplements to include the JAR. Uh, the authority for that is in FAR 1301, if anybody cares. Um, so this is something that not only encouraged, it's, it's authorized. The thing is, it's like any supplement that you see, and a lot of times these supplements, just like the JAR, you want to look at clauses that can be incorporated in DOJ. Uh, RFP, it may not be all of them, but you have to call your section H clause um, that could be uh, a number of different clauses. And they're, they're specialized clauses. Sometimes they're just ginned up by the agency. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're insanely uh, nonsensical. Um, but don't ignore the jar. That's a proposal phase. You, you should consult it. If you have counsel, um, you know, talk to your lawyer about it. I don't think it's going to be the biggest issue uh, or the biggest uh, concern, but you should know what these uh, these are regulations, they're codified regulations, and you should know what's in them. Next slide. Um, some of the, the jar key provisions, and I'll just explain a couple of them. I put the ratification of unauthorized commitments uh, because I get these cases once in a while. Um, only, sorry, only uh, a warranted contracting officer um, has the authority to bind the government. That's in any agency. That's under the FAR. That's in the statute. But you know, there are times that the contracting specialist, the COTAR, the, the core. So for whatever reason, just about every case, erroneously, um, makes a decision or binds the government. It doesn't bind the government. And of course, then, then it becomes a uh, legal mess. Um, and this is why you've got this ratification. This is common in the settlements. It's in the FAR as well. Uh, but I put it there to, to, to underscore that, one, only the CO can bind the government. Two, but if they a decision made by something else that could be a post hoc ratification um, of that commitment. In other words, it's a get out of jail free card uh, for, for these kinds of situations. Class deviations, good example of that is many of the COVID related issues where they lack some of the bar restrictions on competition, for example, um, or what they call these class deviations. And, and typically, they're temporary deviations. Um, I'm not sure where I think at the DOJ that would be of interest. Uh, limited competition, this is, if you look at FAR Part 6, <clears throat> the, the 
competition contracting act or seeker you know it generally requires what they call full and open competition but there are some circumstances when less than full competition would be allowed um, and that's generally what we know as sole source justifications uh, the key ones um, is basically when there's only one responsible source source in other words no one else can make it there are national security exceptions uh, there are international agreements that were for example a foreign government is buying uh, a foreign military sale type uh, uh, contract or buying those services through the DOD. Uh, then by international agreement, they, they may pick the, uh, the source or, or the vendor, or there's the public interest. And again, a lot of these, the public interest especially, uh, were justifications for sole sources during the COVID pandemic. I'll skip foreign acquisition, but uh, solicitation provision contract these are agency specific stuff I, I wouldn't say that there are you know the importing the amount from the jar as opposed to the you know, uh, ERD substance for us um, the one that deviates the most is the one with protests and what we'll talk about uh, and of course you have your protests disputes and appeals uh, next slide please. all right about those protests um, the reason why I put this here because you know different th th there are common rules in terms of bid protests, um, and you're going to get that in the FAR, and you're going to get that in the GAO uh, bid pro protest rules, which are regulations, and then the Court of Federal Claims has its own uh, rules of the court. Um, but I talk about this because it comes up a lot. It comes up in questions. I've done a good number of uh, DOJ protests uh, in different agencies, BOP, FBI, Maine Justice, that kind of thing. Um, and but so I wanted to just address that briefly here. Uh, for those who, who don't know what a bid protest is, it's basically a it's a challenge to the award or proposed award of a federal government contract, or it could be a challenge to the terms of a solicitation for. for uh, solicitation can have an ambiguity, solicitation can be wrong, a solicitation can favor uh, a certain contract, singular contract, contract or uh, then it's not full and open competition when it's supposed to be. But you're challenging an award of a contract, proposed award or a solicitation about it. The timeliness issues here are very important. What I, important when I, what I mean by that is um, at least at the GAO, which is, is is one of the levels to protest that i'll talk about that as well um you have to the basic timeliness rule is, is you have to file your protest 10 days within 10 days of when you knew or should have known the basis of the protest um and so that's very important to know that's for a post-award protest for pre-award protest you must protest uh the terms of solicitation before uh, the, the proposal due date. Uh, if not, GAO is very strict about that. You may have another form in the Court of Federal Claims that the GAO is very strict. If you're not timely filed, uh, your protest is dismissed. It's pretty automatic. Uh, the different forms, well, there's agency. I'll talk about agency level uh, in another slide, but you have your GAO and what we call COPSI, Court of Federal Claims. Um, why you would protest and why you wouldn't, um, I could do a whole seminar on that. Uh, I've seen every single reason to protest and not to protest over 38 years. I mean, you want to protest if there are good grounds. It could be strategic business considerations. Uh, you know, it's a key customer. Um, it's uh, it's a must win. Uh, the, the grounds are you know glaringly um, valid. Uh, but there are a lot of reasons why not to protest. The grounds aren't there. Um, you'd be surprised how many companies protest, even though I'll advise them probably not going to win um, and the majority of protests as you may know are, are not successful uh, and there could be a customer relationship again it's because of the customer you don't want to uh, uh, you know, offend the customer especially if you have a good business relationship good past performance with that customer over the years if we had this conversation 15 years ago or so this would be a bigger issue in terms of how a bid protest might impact customer relationship 
Um, today, not so much because agencies have gotten much more accustomed to these bid protests. In fact, they will budget it in their, their timelines, um, in, in terms of financial budgeting, and, and the industry does the same. Every, every, uh, every capture effort has a bid protest in its time. So, but there, there are as many reasons, if not more, not to protest than to protest. Next slide, please. Um, protest to the agency, and, and that's addressed in the jar uh, with some differences, actually. Um, you know, again, you know, you can't, any of these agency supplements, including the jar, you can't violate the FAR, but you can actually, you know, lower requirements in favor of, of the contract. That's okay. That's an agency specific issue. Um, but an agency level protest is you're not protesting the GAO where there might be a public uh, decision, court of federal claims, and, and the same, but some restrictions. Uh, but you're going right to the contracting officer. It's not a public uh, form. It's not. It's not supposed to be publicly released. Although I've seen that happen, um, it's less expensive. <coughs> Excuse me. It's much more informal than going to the uh, GAO or COPSI. Uh, there is a prescribed RFP clause in the jar during the protest, and you'll see that hyperlink. Um, but but basically, and it has the same FAR 33 type uh, procedures for that. Um, and there, and there is an option that the protester can take has to do so in its protest letter, uh, by requesting a decision either by the, the CO or designated agency protest official or APO that's appointed by the HCA or again, head of the contracting, uh, agency or uh, activity. So in any case, you know, you can get a decision that's above the, the level of the CEO. That's supposed to be to, to, to make it more objective, give it like an abundant feeling. Not always the case, by the way. Um, people are objective, they're not objective. It's not that they don't talk, they do. So by going to the agency, I don't usually uh, recommend agency level protests. For some reasons that they would be more important penalty. You know what's going to happen. Um, you have to have, you know, it has to contain a detailed statement of legal and factual grounds. It's not as strict as the GAO or the Court of Federal Claims. It has to request some relief and it should state that it is a protest. So you don't have to litigate over what it is. Um, and the COAPO, they, this is an uncommon requirement in other supplements, not in the FAR, but the COAPO must, must conduct um, a scheduling conference either in person, telephonic, doing Zooms as well, within five days after the protest is filed. Go to the next slide, please. Um, and as well, again, it's not, this is not in the FAR and other agency supplements. I don't know every one of them, but here the COAPO, you know, it makes sense for DOJ, may, so it's discretionary, may conduct an oral hearing during that scheduling conference. It's at the same time they're doing a scheduling conference. They can have an oral hearing. They usually tell you ahead of time, ahead of time, so you can so you can prepare for it. Um, you don't see that in agency level protests. Uh, very, I think I can't. I don't think I can remember what other agency does it this way. But DOJ has this added, um, and it's actually good because if you do an agency protest, at least you know you'll get more of a hearing than sending a letter and getting one. Um, the, the protest uh, will have the effect of holding up the award if it's received prior to award. In other words, it's a pre-award protest, so you, you're challenging the solicitation. Uh, that being the case, they will they can go through the, the procurement process, but they can't make an award under the regulation. Um, and if it's it's post-award, then performance then is suspended if, if the protest is received within 10 days. The award typical time that's required, uh, and if unless the HCA decides otherwise, um, and that's what they call overriding a stay, mm -hmm. a stay being a suspension or a stay uh, of an award or a performance, that's what they call an override. A lot of legal stuff involved in that, so I won't get into it. 
there's no discovery here. It's not like the GAO where you get uh, what they call an agency record, which is you know, cradle to grave of the procurement process, the evaluation, that kind of thing. You don't have that. Here. Um, and the, the requirement for the COAPO is that it has to make a best effort, which means if they missed it, uh, what's a best effort? Uh, best effort to decide the protests within 20 days after the file. The, the FAR requires 35. So this is where they, they have a shorter period. Um, you can protest to the agency before the GAO or the Court of Federal Claims. Um, so, but, it, you know, again, um, when I say it has its merits and shortcomings, you know, sometimes it, it could be a waste of time. Sometimes it could be... Uh, the best course. One of the examples might be, depends on a lot of different issues, might be where uh, there's such a glaring mistake, and not really for GWACs because there's just too many parties involved, but there's such a glaring mistake or a defect in the solicitation that you want to bring it to the agency's attention in a more discreet manner than going to the GAO. Uh, you know, your resentment level may be. Um, you know, maybe less, and uh, you, you might get a quicker uh, corrective action. Uh, again, if it's very obvious. One thing to remember, uh, and you know, again, there's a lot of reasons to protest, not protest. The, the, they are rare. If you look at you know the amount of contracts that are let, and the dollars that are let, that are that are contracted, that are awarded, uh, they are very rare. Um, what's even more rare are sustained protests, which doesn't mean you win. To me, a lot of lawyers, winning is, oh, we, uh, the GAO is sustained. That means they thought we were right in the protest. Doesn't mean anything if you don't get the revenue. Um, so a sustained protest doesn't mean you win, but they're, they're even rarer. And protests generated contract wins, hence your revenue is even more rare. So everybody should think twice about protesting, but certainly think hard. Next slide. Last thing I'm, I'm going to do is uh, just to mention of uh, the briefings um, because I, I see a lot of things uh, when I advise clients. Uh, this is not specifically in the jar, but just go to these, these FAR 15, 505, and 506, and you'll see them. But it's um, I, I mention it because there are. Um, so many things that, uh, so many times that people um, have not asked for a debriefing, uh, even when they win, um, when they should have. So um, there's two major types of these debriefings, pre-award and post-award. Um, and the, all you, you, to get a debriefing, if you're a, a, what they call a disappointed bill, but you're hard earned money and long hours and hard resources into submitting a proposal and think you're going to win, and you don't. Um, you may ask for uh, a debriefing. The pre award is, is, is uh, within three days after receipt of notice of the exclusion from the competition. Post award is, is three days um, uh, after you receive the uh, disappointed bid or what's called a notification letter. Um, you can, as the offeror, request that the debriefing be delayed. I'm very careful in doing that. Um, the, the one thing is the, to know the purpose of these. The, the original purpose when the FAR first came out, they, they weren't designed for bid protest. They were designed to allow offerors to gain uh, insight into the evaluation of it, its proposal to improve their future bids. Now it's almost always used in connection with as a prelude to a, a bid process. The thing is always requested, whether you win or whether you lose. Uh, even though that wasn't the original intent, many winners don't request uh, debriefings, which could give them insight as into what defects they were. I mean, they could have just, they could have, just won this by the skin of their teeth. And they want to know why it wasn't an overwhelming uh, win. But you know, an award's an award. But you want to know the good and bad and the ugly about your proposal. And this process allows you to do that. Uh, but they are essentially, uh, and they are important for, for good protests. 
Um, and by the way, if it's a GSA scheduled return, they don't use them. They call they use what they call brief explanations, which don't amount to much. It's not a real um, the briefing. Uh, the, the briefings under the FAR, they the agency has to discuss the, the deficiencies and significant weaknesses or weaknesses of your you again your proposal, not the competitors. And uh, if if uh, available, the ratings, past performance ratings. Uh, the evaluation methodology, the total evaluation, the evaluated cost, um, and the summary for uh, the rationale uh, for the reward decision. And then it has a sentence in the FAR that says, and then it can give reasonable responses to relevant questions, whatever that means. Um, it's a bit broad. Um, so the, the, the point being is that you should always ask for these debriefings. Uh, so all in all, the jar is uh, it's it, it has a couple of remarkable, I wouldn't say deviations, but differences, uh, but not not ones that uh, overrule the FAR. Um, otherwise, it it has uh, pretty much what other uh, FAR supplements would have from an agency perspective. Some of them, as you can see, they're um, unique in a sense because it's it, it is a law enforcement agency. It's an agency. With probably more lawyers than any other. So I will stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much again, Jim, for such a great presentation. Um, should you have any questions for Jim, his contact information is on the slide here. Um, and again, we will be sending out um, the slides, will be posted directly following this webinar. So you can click on um, all those hyperlinks that. Jim mentioned as well. Um, yeah, so thank you all for attending and we hope to see you on Friday um, as we dig through the uh, procurement playbook for the Department of Justice. So we'll see you then. Uh, have a great day. This concludes the webinar.